Hi, um, I'm Scott Alberts. I am a professor here at Truman State University. Normally I teach statistics, but today I'm going to briefly talk about rhetoric. Um, this talk was designed for my classes, but I'm sharing it publicly on YouTube. So even if you aren't in my class, maybe you'll find something useful. The class I originally scripted this talk for, GEMS 352, is a junior level interdisciplinary writing course called Why You're Wrong, focused on how and why people change their minds or not in the face of new evidence and data. I use it in other classes as well because we scientists are always looking for ways to convince people of things. There are really two ideas of what we're doing here. The first one, which I'm not really gonna talk about today, is to figure out why you believe something. Why do you think something is right? How do you evaluate different kinds of evidence and arguments to figure out what you think is right and wrong? What is truth and what is true to you? All those sorts of things we typically talk about. We normally divide those into two main categories, what we call inductive logic, which is based on evidence. We in statistics think that's what we would call data. The idea that if you see something happen frequently and often and consistently, you start to think it's true. And deductive logic which is based on abstract ideas going from assumptions to conclusions. What we think of as math, but also what we think of as religion. There are some other things in there as well, but typically we base our arguments on inductive logic and deductive logic. The second part though, what I will talk about today is how you convince everyone else to agree with you. And that's what the field of rhetoric is about. So you figured out what's right and what's wrong and you want everyone else to agree with you. You want them to meekly submit to the error of their ways and come along and that's what rhetoric is what we do. And after that, of course, we win. Rhetoric is a whole field of its own. And the idea is that um, we do want to um, inform, persuade and motivate uh, audiences about what we're doing. And again, if you're really interested in that, you should take a whole class or learn about that more directly. And here at Truman, our students all do, for the most part, take a class where rhetoric is uh, covered very centri centrally. When you do take that class, one of the things they talk about are the three modes of persuasion. Um, if you did take a communication class, a speech class, you probably heard that uh, terms. And uh, logos, ethos, and pathos are the three words that we really do want to focus on. Logos is the one that I think we in the academy, especially we who are scientists, like to think we do all the time. The idea of logos is that you're appealing to logic and reason. That is the evidence you've collected, both inductive and deductive uh, logic. Um, if you do it correctly, you might even call it a proof, right? And when you've proven something to be true, someone can't even argue with you about it. Now, when you don't do logos correctly, that's where you bring up logical fallacies, when you have contradictions that don't fit your theory, uh, consistently. And again, I'm not going to talk about that too much today because in a way that's the easy one. If you're doing science correctly, if you're correcting your information the right way, logos should be pretty obvious to you. And that said, I think we're sometimes frustrated when our great arguments made with great evidence aren't really believed and that's sometimes because of the other two modes. The second uh, mode of persuasion is called ethos. And the idea here is that we're appealing to a speaker's authority. Um, so for instance, right, uh, I have a PhD, I have a big poofy robe up there on the wall. You might think that I know what I'm talking about. Of course, I'm outside my main area of expertise, so maybe you wouldn't believe me quite as much as you would if, say, I were talking about confidence intervals or p-values. Um, lots of times uh, we do want to think about these, um, not just in because whether or not we have ethos or not, but how we can build ethos. How can we build our authority. Sometimes that's by citing people that we've studied with or things that we know or courses we've completed, but sometimes it's just uh, having this sort of authority because you have experience with it. And certainly um, one of the things we learned in my engineering courses was that, you know, we spent a lot of time doing mathematical models of how a factory works or how machines work, but if you talk to the guy on the assembly, uh, on the assembly room floor, they might know how it works just as well and they might have ideas that you didn't learn with your fancy theory or your fancy mathematics. And the idea that you are outside of your main area, the idea that your sources aren't believable, um, those are all things that can be these violations or these uh, ways that weaken your ethos argument. The third uh, mode of persuasion is called pathos. And the idea here is it's an appeal to emotion. And I think those of us, again, in the academy or in science, um, we would say that this is the weakest one, but in truth, 
it's the one that people usually go to first. And if you really believe what your heart says, you're going to use pathos. And what some stuffy academic or uh, person on a YouTube video says might not persuade you. There are several ideas of violating pathos, um, for instance, just speaking poorly. Um, this is a YouTube video, so how am I doing? Um, giving it in a boring mode. Um, I do have some slides here, but man, if I had some cool anima animations, wouldn't that be better? I'm trying to look at the camera. I'm trying to do stuff like that, but those sorts of things can help your pathos argument. One that I can't do as well on YouTube, but you could do when you're actually giving a talk to a room is being aware of the audience that you're talking to. Certainly I have an idea of what my students are like. And if you're one of my students, hey, how's it going? But if you're just watching this on YouTube, I don't know what your uh, condition is, what you're looking for this, why are you even watching this video? And so we typically don't talk about this mode as much outside of rhetoric classes, but it is really important. And this idea that I can somehow read my audience, I can think about where my audience is coming from in order to build a better argument. I think that's a really important uh, thing to think about. And it's one that we don't always um, include as we're figuring out how to convince people about what we're doing. Most important though, is the idea that you have to blend these different modes. Um, rather than thinking about which one is most important is the idea that you wanna use them all. The way to win is all of the above. Certainly for some things, ethos is gonna be the most important for some things, logos for some things, pathos, but really having a mix of the three, being able to kind of seamlessly switch between logical and emotional arguments, being able to build your credibility, that'll help you regardless of what you're talking about. There are two other ideas I wanna talk about um, here that aren't part of the three modes of persuasion, but I think are part of this idea of how you convince people. One of them is the idea of kairos. And again, that's a Greek word that means uh, time, but it's different than uh, chronos, which is the one that means time in the literal sense. Uh, kairos in modern Greek, I learned, uh, means weather. And so it's figuring out how to um, get things to fit when they work. What arguments will work today that maybe didn't work last week? Um, maybe giving the same talk in two different rooms at two different days at two different situations will give you very different results. Um, the idea of figuring out how to respond to what the person on the other team, what's somebody trying to persuade you in the other direction, what are they doing? Can we respond to that in such a way in our argument in order to kind of preempt them and to really get our conclusion uh, to go well? Kairos also has the idea that different times in history more broadly mean different things. And maybe you heard the old curse, may you live in interesting times. And I don't know if that's true or not, especially the idea that we'd like to live in boring times. But many people say there's no such thing as boring times. There's just what's exciting right now because different things are important as different times. And so that idea of figuring out what is the circumstance you're in right now and how you're gonna use that to your advantage is really the idea of Kairos in this context. The fifth word is topos. And again, topos means topic, literally. And it's the idea that things fit into categories, things fit together in a way within a single topic. Um, certainly when we teach writing or we teach critical thinking, one of the things we talk about is in a paper, in a speech, it should be about one thing and everything you do should hang with that. You shouldn't take digressions into other topics. You shouldn't um, be distracted in the middle of your talk. It should be about one thing and one thing only. Similarly, as you're thinking about how you're building your rhetorical frames, do they fit together? Do they work well as a team? Are you switching in a way that seems really abrupt or really uh, nonsensical? If this was actually one of my live classes, I would then move from here to show three different videos where you would look at how did they do in this circumstance. And um, one of them that I use uh, very frequently is Hans Rosling, who is uh, the author of Factfulness, which is a great book. Um, but he's also one of the great TED Talk uh, presenters. And so if you ever have a chance, you should watch Hans Rosling video on the magic washing machines. And what I would ask you to do in my class is to think about how they're using these five words. Have they presented why you should believe them? Heck, maybe if you're given a TED Talk, you already have that ethos for free because you're on the stage of a TED Talk. Um, are you using emotional arguments? Are you using logic and reason in a thoughtful, appropriate way? Are you building things appropriate to the time and place that you're in? And are you uh, building a frame or a worldview that fits together? Are you sticking to topic? So I hope this gives you a quick understanding of how um, these things work. And um, again, if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Um, this is where I'm supposed to like, like me on Facebook or uh, subscribe to my channel. So thanks.